fact, what I'd like to talk about is um, a little more general, and that is the context for PEPFAR in development in general and the future in that regard, uh, where we came from and, and some opportunities going forward. Uh, in context, uh, as Mike mentioned, PEPFAR, it's actually not only the largest per international health initiative in, history, in um, U.S. history, it's the largest in history period. Um, and at $19 billion, which doesn't sound like a lot of money, except when you consider when we started, the annual appropriation was in the uh, $500 million range. Uh, so it's huge by development standards. I'm told, I'm not sure if this is true, but I'm told that is the single largest discretionary program in the United States government, uh, including domestic programs. So it's a very large program. Uh, but it doesn't stand alone. Um, and it actually was part of something that President Bush called a new era in development. And I think that's important because there, was an I there were ideas behind it and it was part of a larger picture. And the reason I want to talk about that is because I think it's important to look to the future to think about where it came from. And the ideas behind it were very important and formed a new framework, a new framework for how we looked at development. It changed the old approach, which was donors and recipients, a very paternalistic approach, uh, and said that that's the wrong approach. That's the wrong framework for looking at development. That what really matters is country leadership, what's commonly called country ownership, but that means countries themselves, governments, and the people of the countries uh, direct, own, manage, and lead their own programs. And I think that's a critical change. In order for countries to do that, they, there has to be good governance. You have to have a results-based approach. You can't achieve, the countries can't achieve what they want to achieve without good governance and without a results-based approach. All sectors need to be engaged. For a long time, development was thought of only as a government activity. But if you don't have the non-governmental sector, the communities, the community organizations, the people on the ground, faith community-based organizations and the private sector engaged, basically if you don't have people owning their lives, you're not going to tackle development problems. And the last principle, that economic growth is key. Development programs are stop gaps as countries grow economically, um, but it's an important stop gap to save lives along the way. This new approach, which seems like a lot of common sense, was not the way we did development before. In fact, the New York Times called it a philosophical revolution, which I don't think is actually an, an overstatement. It was a fundamentally different approach, and it changed the conversation. It changed the conversation about development not only in the United States, but globally. Now, I think an important piece of that that is PEPFAR specific is that if in development we're going to ask for good governance abroad, we need good governance at home, and we needed a much better management approach to how the U.S. government did development. And I think this is relevant for multilaterals as well. When PEPFAR started, uh, what we inherited and saw across U U.S. government programs and HIV, which was true in development, is a very siloed, very fragmented approach. And that doesn't get you very far. What it gets you is a lot of turf wars. Uh, we were actually to a point where in countries, U.S. government people employed by all of us, all of us taxpayers, from USAID, from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, from Department of Defense, sometimes Department of Labor, Peace Corps, were all doing HIV programs, but they frequently didn't know each other. Literally, I was in countries where they did not know each other as people. They didn't have their phone numbers. They had absolutely no idea what programs they were working on uh, individually. So CDC would be running a program, USAID, sometimes in the same district, and they wouldn't know what was happening with another program run by the US government. And the ambassadors were completely out of the loop because the agencies didn't want anyone to know what they were doing because that's how they protected their ownership. That is not a way to approach HIV AIDS. It is not a way to approach development. And that is something that was repeated across the US government. So again, if we were going to ask countries to practice good governance, it's kind of incumbent on us to at practice good governance. And so what PEPFAR did was say that's not a very good approach and that we needed to bring everyone together under one strategic vision in a common framework that limited uh, overlap and that had everyone going in the same direction. And we hope that direction was to support governments and countries to achieve their goals in development and in HIV in specific. 
Now that shift required a lot of bureaucratic maneuvers, which I'm happy to talk about in the question period if you all want to talk about them. Uh, it wasn't easy. It's nowhere near done. But what it also required was leadership, leadership in global health. And Mike asked me to talk a little bit about that and a new approach to leadership. Part of that leadership was accepting that we weren't supposed to be in control. An important part of leadership is sometimes ceding responsibility. And it is a very important step for us to say we are not donors and recipients. We are equal partners. And that what people in other countries did were more, was actually more important and that we are indeed the junior partner when we're dealing with development, that we are actually supporting them, not, not, not they are doing what we ask them to do. It's a leadership style that I know most people in this room probably don't want to believe, but was inherent to President Bush. He actually had that view and that leadership style. The view, actually, that we needed to get to country ownership very much emanated from his belief and from all of our beliefs that development is not about helping poor and educated people, that it is simply a life circumstance where you live, and that development is not because we are the shining knights coming to help people or save them. We're coming to support extraordinary human beings who, if given the chance, will take their lives in control and tackle their problems. And so a big part of global leadership in health, which Mike asked me to talk about, is to accept that difference, that change in dynamic. Another important part of the leadership is to care about the issue. This is a deeply personal issue for a lot of people who worked on it, from President Bush to the people on the ground. People cared enough to change the bureaucracy, to overcome bureaucratic obstacles, because they cared about the people on the ground. It also meant believing in people, uh, as I mentioned, to sh not only shift that dynamic of who's in charge, but to actually make yourself unimportant. That's a really important thing in global leadership on HIV AIDS, but I think in development in general and in management in general, that a good leader actually makes themselves unimportant because you empower the people around you to take charge. Another part of this global leadership shift was in HIV and development was holding high standards, holding people to high standards. The president of Kagame of Rwanda was talking about PEPFAR and talked about this and said, one of the most remarkable things, it was for the first time, people were holding them to a high standard. Not in a paternalistic way, but in believing in them enough to say, we believe you can achieve this. And as he said, when you hold people to high standards, they actually will step up. If you presume people can't achieve anything, they're not going to meet anything. They're not going to feel like they need to achieve anything. And that is a fundamental piece of this new leadership. The last piece, I think, was getting the best out of people. And that had to do with all of the above by acknowledging that we were the junior partner, that we were there to support, by believing in people, by believing in so much that we would hold them to high standards, you got the most out of people. And that was leadership. That was leadership from individuals, and it was leadership from a government, the United States government, and it was leadership from the people in the countries, from presidents on down. Dambiso Moyo, I'm sure some of you have seen her book, Dead Aid, is basically a decade old. It argues basically that most of the leaders in Africa are a bunch of corrupt people who are just trying to steal from their people. There's still some of that. There's still some of that in this country. But by and large, there's been a huge shift in the leadership in the people in Africa, from presidents to ministers of health, within the ministries and on the ground, people running NGOs who are trying to take and control their lives if we give them the support. And so that leadership component of global health from presidents down to people on the ground had a major impact on our approach to good governance and why PEPFAR succeeded. So what are the results? How did things actually turn out? Well, there are a couple things in general I want to talk about and then specifically. One is, and I think this may be one of the most important legacies of PEPFAR, is it's the first ever effort in development to deal with a chronic disease. That's a rather remarkable statement. And some of that has to do with that global leadership. Literally seven years ago, when the UN General Assembly was arguing about Millennium Development Goals, many countries, including the United States, argued against treatment goal, a treatment goal. And some of that was money, but a lot of it was people actually thought that people in developing countries were incapable of managing a chronic healthcare delivery system. People made some pretty outrageous statement about watches and telling time and a lot of pretty other, other terrible things. 
But it really was the first time we attacked a chronic disease and believed in people to, achieve, to deal with a chronic disease. And that is going to have huge impacts in how we deal with global health. So I think that's an important success and legacy of the program, which was very much related to that sh philosophical revolution in how we approach things. But in addition to that general approach of changing a perception of development uh, and a culture around development, we also had very specific goals related to HIV which were prevention, treatment, and care. And it was also the first initiative that said you can't do one without the other. That moved past the debates of should we do prevention or treatment. No one ever talked about care, which was a great tragedy, uh, because you can't do effective treatment or prevention without care, and all these orphans are dying with no education and no food, but very few people were talking about that. It was just treatment or, or prevention. It was the first initiative to say you can't do one without the other. And I'm afraid today we're losing that. We're getting back to treatment or prevention Again, care is getting lost. But we had very specific goals. Two million people supported for treatment, seven million infections of burden, 10 million in care. Within several months ahead of schedule, President Bush announced that we achieved the treatment goal, supported treatment for more than 2.1 million people, up from zero five years earlier. Uh, Stanford University did a study that, can, that demonstrated that that led to a million lives saved in just the first three years. Uh, millions of lives have been saved as a result of the treatment goal being met. Today, four million people in the developing world are in treatment. About three million of them are supported from the American people. Uh, rather dramatic, from zero, literally, from zero and everyone saying you couldn't do treatment to having four million people in treatment uh, just a few years later. Prevention, it's too early to tell. The goal was actually a 2010 goal, but all the trends are going in the right direction. And this is a point people really aren't paying attention to. Treatment is something you can measure rapidly, and we did measure rapidly because it's relatively easy to measure. You can go to a clinic and tell many people in treatment. Prevention takes years because you're doing demographic health surveys every five years. The recent results are rather breathtaking. South Africa just reported that in the last three years, there was a 40 to 60 percent reduction, 40 to 60 percent reduction in every category of 15 to 24-year-olds. Unbelievable. We had never seen anything other than a straight up pattern in South Africa before. The importance about 15 to 24 year olds is it's an incidence marker because those are new people coming into the infection because they're getting outside of 25 year olds in the course of a demographic health survey. We don't have good incidence markers, but it's as good as we're going to get. Namibia reported a 50% reduction in prevalence among 15 to 24 year olds. 50% reduction. Fascinating, they didn't see much of a reduction above 24-year-olds. We've seen 33% reductions in Kenya, 25% reduction in Botswana recently, 25% reduction at least in Zimbabwe, huge reductions in HIV rates. Doesn't mean we don't have a long way to go, we've got a very long way to go, but it's a very good trend in the right direction. On care, in the, the goal was met, more than 10 million people in care, including 4 million orphans and vulnerable children. So I think the results, both in terms of changing the approach, but also in terms of the actual results, were rather remarkable. But there are a couple of very important issues and challenges, and um, I'm only going to deal with a couple of them. The first is country ownership itself. If we're honest with ourselves, there was a real struggle early on with country ownership. Some of that is the way the program was announced. It was announced picking countries. There were trade-offs to the way that was done. Uh, it was the only way it would work in the State of the Union address. But there's also part of the culture of our development structure that tilts towards we own things and don't want to give them up. Uh, I've actually sat in rooms with junior foreign service officers lecturing ministers of health about how they should run their programs in their country. That's an intrinsic, inherent part of our development infrastructure. And we didn't overcome it. We still very much live in that. But we understood that, and towards the end of the program, we developed what were called partnership frameworks, where we expected countries and the United States to sit down together to think about in five years where they wanted to go and where we wanted to go together, where we wanted to support them. I think a demonstration of how far we have to go, it's a great effort, how far we have to go is the night before one of these partnership frameworks was due, the deputy chief of mission from a country called and asked me if it was okay if he submitted it without checking with the Minister of Health. That's not country ownership. And I think it's a demonstration of how far we have to go, even when we try to get there. Um, the fact that the 
deputy um, chief of mission was surprised when I told him that he couldn't submit it until he got the support of the Minister of Health was equally telling. A second huge challenge is integration of programs. I don't mean PEPFAR paying for everything. That's not the way any structure should work. One of the biggest flaws in development is thinking every project should solve every problem, which usually means we don't do anything. But it does, there is a challenge to integrate. Uh, HIV services can't stand alone. Maternal child health is linked to it. Water is linked to it. Family planning is linked to it. Safe uh, uh, nutrition is linked to it. Health systems and building health structures are linked to it. Our development structures are not built for such integration. Let me give you a couple of frightening examples. A team, the team in Haiti, the PEPFAR team in Haiti, we wanted to support food and nutrition for orphans and for pregnant women, important part of HIV programs. Rather than PEPFAR starting a whole new granting process for food, the Haiti team came up with a great idea. We would just give money to the Food for Peace program of USAID, and they would manage the program effectively for us, report back to us, but we wouldn't have to set up new structures. The procurement officer said we couldn't do that. that. That was not allowed by the rules. We had to do separate announcements for food and nutrition programs outside of the Food for Peace program. Totally untrue legally, by the way, but that's the nature of how siloed our programs are. When the, when the malaria program started, we had a huge supply chain management system, which we had just funded. Nine organizations, including two in Africa, that were built to supply, to ensure no stock out of drugs with regional medical cent with regional supply centers in three parts of Africa that avoided any significant stock outs. It, that supply system included bed nets and ACTs because pregnant women and young kids who are HIV positive were particularly susceptible to malaria, so we felt we needed to supply those products. When the President's Malaria Initiative started, we went to them and said, use our infrastructure use the supply chain management system that we have. You'll have to pay a little bit incrementally to increase it, but use the system. The lawyers wouldn't let us. They issued a separate announcement. They basically hired the exact same people. So now we have the same people doing two supply systems, getting double paid, and countries have to deal with an HIV supply system and a malaria supply system from the US government. Now, these are not the decisions of individual people who are trying to do the right thing. The idea in Haiti came from development officers. Our development people are among the most dedicated, talented people you will come across. But the structure and culture of our development organizations does not lend itself to integration. That's not unique to the bilateral system. The UN system is no different. Everything is siloed and separated. And what happens, unfortunately, is people get more and more removed from the country. Those silos lead to turf wars. And people make decisions in Washington or in Geneva that actually kill people without thinking about that. All that is thought about is how much money does this organization control, are lines of procurement respected, not how many lives could be saved if we did it a different way. And that's a big problem. And so full country ownership and integration are two big challenges, not only for PEPFAR, but how the US government and actually <coughs> multilaterally and multinationally and in particular, the UN systems, we do development. So looking to the future, what are some possibilities? What are some ways out of this? You know, as President Bush said with PEPFAR, this, it was a good start. A lot of people say it's a huge success. I personally believe that. But it's a start. It's only a start to try to unravel 50 years of development based on post-colonial guilt and, cold, and the Cold War and for siloed, separated systems. So we have a couple of options going forward. One is to break apart and remake the US government development infrastructure that is focused on that, those principles of the new era in development, focused on, fully focused on country ownership, good governance, results base, uh, and all sectors being engaged. That requires a huge cultural and structural shift. It requires remaking human resource, procurement, all the systems that no one wants to talk about when they talk about development reform, but that's where the heart of it is. That's where bad decisions get made. That's where non-integration occurs. No doubt we have to do that. We cannot tolerate any longer our current approach to development within the US government. But that's going to take a lot of time, huge bureaucratic hurdles. We're fighting upstream against 50 years of laws, regulations, practice, policy, culture, and structure. But there's no question we need to undertake that battle 
and Congress is looking to reform what they call foreign assistance. It would be nice if we got rid of the term assistance altogether because it implies that donor-recipient paternalistic approach. Regardless, we have some opportunities and we ought to do that. But we also have another option, which is radical change. While we are fixing our own development structure, look to new architectures and new approaches that could radically change. PEPFAR is not that. PEPFAR was the beginning. It was a transi transi transitionary phase to save a lot of lives. It could be transformed for, through partnership compacts. It could be transformed as we look to more integrated services to fill some of these gaps and roles, but that's not what it was designed for. The Millennium Challenge Corporation, a very innovative structure that was also created in the last administration, and the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria are probably the two institutions that in original design and by architecture are best designed to move forward in a new era in development based on those principles. And so another option as we're building the US architecture or rebuilding the US architecture is to look at those two as opportunities. And perhaps the greatest opportunity is the Global Fund because it's the right thing to do. It's multilateral. It has all stakeholders engaged. And it meets those principles. Although institutionally it has some things to work out, it's probably the right structure. And my own view is that we should expand it to a global fund for health so that there's one funding source for an integrated approach across all the health-related development goals. And that if you have one funding stream, you then are able to support countries for a country-owned approach that would integrate programs without having the pre-existing silos. You have the chance to do something new. You have the chance to form and frame something that isn't retrofitting. It's somewhat the same system as I was coming up on reason why coming up on the train today, I lost calls about seven times on the eastern seaboard of the United States. But if you go to the most rural, remote area in Africa, you'll get great cell phone service. They didn't have to retrofit. They could start new. We could do the same with development. We can look for the new architecture, the new approach that doesn't require a lot of painful retrofitting. And the Global Fund and the Millennium Challenge Corporation offer that opportunity. But we need to be merit-based. If the Global Fund or the Millennium Challenge Corporation stray from those principles of new era development, which they can do, they are also bureaucratic institutions, or if existing institutions like the US government bilateral programs or PEPFAR evolve as they need to to better fit those principles, then let's go with that. Let's go with whatever meets those principles of a new era in development, not prejudge what the best is. A little competition is a very healthy thing. A little competition between CDC and USAID and DOD is one of the reasons we succeeded in PEPFAR. So let's create the principles and see who gets there. Let's hold out a merit-based approach and let's move there. At the moment, we probably need both PEPFAR, PMI, and the Global Fund as we're scaling up, but for the future, Let's find out what works best and invest in that. And I don't know which one it will be, but if I had to put money down, I'd say the Global Fund and the MCC. So I'm actually going to end there because I think I mostly want to have a conversation with you. But I do think we are at a unique moment in history. We are at a time when people recognize the harm both to our moral character and to our security and strategic interests of a lack of development. We have an opportunity with a new generation of leaders, both in this country, globally, I'm talking about from the last 10 years going forward, uh, and in country most importantly. We have opportunity. We can take the easy way out. We can take the Dambiso Moyo kill aid. We can take the approach of partial and imperfect reforms that won't get us to where we need to be. Or we can say, let's do something radical and let's focus on saving lives and lifting up lives. Let's focus on development and getting there. And we have that opportunity today. So I look forward to talking with you more and to hear your thoughts and your questions and comments.